Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Gary Shu uh, from University of Wisconsin at Madison, USA. Uh, he's a renowned expert in the area of string phenomenology and uh, his work is basically based on particle physics, string theory and cosmology. So uh, he got a lot of awards and recognition in this area uh, but like those who don't know about him for them just uh, he was a research associate at Stony Brook uh, for two years from 98 to 2000 then he was a senior associate at the University of Pennsylvania for two years up to 2002 and then he joined as a assistant professor at this university. And now he's continuing as a professor. So it's a great pleasure to have you uh, uh, in this uh, uh, Zoominar series. So this is basically the 40th talk of this series. And uh, it's a like honor for us that you have agreed to give the talk and uh, we are w welcoming you from Potsdam. So now you can start. So uh, thank you Sayatan for the invitation and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm honored to be the 40th speakers of your seminar series. Uh, these are rather strange times and I'm glad to see that you're all safe and well. Uh, after a very long lockdown, um, I'm looking forward to some human interactions, even just remotely. But uh, I really hope that in the not so distant future, we will be able to see each other for real. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to tell you a bit about quantum gravity and the swarm lab. Now, what gave string theory its appeal is not only that it offers a consistent framework for quantum field theory and gravity to meet, uh, but also a sense of uniqueness. Um, for example, in 10 dimensions with minimal supersymmetry, there are only four chiral theories that are free of gravitational and gauge anomalies. Uh, two of them with gauge group E8 times E8 and SO32 can be realized by the heterotic string. The other two with uh, a large number of U1 gauge factors have always been considered somewhat peculiar, and I have more to say about them later. Now, moving on to four dimensions, the vacuum structure of string theory at first appeared to be equally restrictive. Back in the 80s, there were only a handful of known Calabial spaces, uh, internal spaces on which string theory compatify, so few that we can even name them. So this table is from the classic paper of Candelas et al, where they gave a table of all the known Calabial manifolds at that time. Uh, now, maybe, Gary, I, I have a very like uh, yeah. basic question. So when you have mentioned about the related gauge groups, so what this sup, uh, the superscript corresponds to? U1 to 48. Yeah, so, so the first two can be realized by the heterotic string. That was uh, uh, the discovery in the 80s. Yeah, the, yeah. Other two, the other two were perfectly anomaly-free theories. Nonetheless, nobody had found a string realization of these two anomaly-free gravitational theories. And I have more to say about that. Turns out they are not consistent, as far as we know, when we couple them to gravity. So there are some subtle conditions that are not uh, visible from a point-particle point of view. Okay. Uh, if you use anomalies to try to detect if anything is wrong, you don't find any. But then there are some more subtle constraints that we discovered basically just last year. Okay, okay. Sure. Yeah. So, so keep in mind that, so the point I wanted to make here is that uh, anomaly cancellation is very restrictive. They give you only four possibilities. Two of them, we already know how to do that. The other two, we don't. And turns out things that we don't know how to realize in string theory are in fact secretly inconsistent. Okay. Now, fast forward 30 years. String theories have gone further in finding new ways to construct consistent chiral theories coupled to gravity. Um, in addition to the heterotic string, 
we can now construct phenomenologically interesting model in every known formulation of string theory. Uh, these formulations go under the name of type 1, type 2a, type 2b, m theory, f theory, and so on. So in some corners of string theory, the number of back here was estimated to be 10 to the 500. Now, if you have been watching your string theory stocks lately, this number has gone up substantially. And there's no indication that this number will stop growing. Now, you notice that I put VAC here in quotes because they are not necessarily local minimum of a potential as in the case of the electroweak VAC here. They are nonetheless solutions of string theory. Um, but even so, string theory seems to offer us an enormous number of possibilities, and you, as you can see. Now, this is also the reason why string theory has been a constant source of ideas for physics beyond the standard model. Um, however, this huge number that you see here may give you the impression that anything goes. This begs the question, are there low energy effective field theories? Um, you can write down that uh, turn out to be inconsistent when you couple them to gravity. And if the answer is no, you may simply forget about string theory and work directly with these EFTs, knowing whatever you do will turn out to be OK, even though you may not be able to construct them directly from string theory. But if there's no obstruction of embedding this back here into a fundamental theory of quantum gravity, you may simply take it as a starting point for conducting your studies. This is where the swamland idea comes in. So the landscape may be vast. As you can see, I was throwing very large numbers at you. But there may be an even vaster swamland somewhere out there. So the term swamland is used to refer to the space of seemingly consistent quantum field theories, which are nonetheless inconsistent when you try to couple them to gravity. So knowing where the boundaries are, where the, knowing where the boundaries of possibilities are, we can still try to make predictions, even though the landscape may be vast. So the question is, what physical properties delineate the landscape from the boundary, from, from the landscape from the swampland? In other words, where are the boundaries? And perhaps to you, more importantly, what are the phenomenological consequences? So, so if we can somehow. I have one question. Yes. Can Go we ahead. treat uh, swampland theory as an effective field theory? Yes. So, uh, so um, if you uh, write down an effective field theory, you don't necessarily worry about whether the effective field theories, where you couple uh, the theory to gravity, is consistent or not. Yeah. So you check all you can within your knowledge of quantum field theory, gauge anomalies, and so on, and you find that the theory satisfy all these conditions. So they are good effective field theories. That could be the starting point for your phenomenological study. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if you ask a deeper question, can these theories be descending from a fundamental theory of quantum gravity uh, such as string theory, then the answer is not every one of them can be. And we want to know what theories can be made consistent with gravity and what theories cannot be made consistent with gravity. And the one that cannot be made consistent, we call them uh, theories in the swampland, whereas theories that can be realized in string theory or other quantum theory of gravity, we refer to them as living in the landscape. Does that answer your question? Yeah, true. Great. So this is the idea of the swampland. And uh, by now, there are varying degree of understanding for different swampland criteria and how they are connected to each other. Now, there are many, many conjectures about quantum gravity. And I have only listed uh, some of the most well-known conjectures uh, on this slide, namely the weak gravity conjecture, the distance conjecture, and the so-called De conjecture. So what is interesting is that uh, we have gathered some evidence, although maybe not to the extent that we can call this evidence as proof, but more importantly, not only do we know they have some uh, 
possibility of being true, perhaps we can prove this statement more concretely in the future. But more interestingly, they are connected in a rather intricate way with other statements about quantum gravity. So together, they give us more confidence about this program as a whole. Um, so not only are this, uh, you know, sort of um, random statements about quantum gravity, they are related to each other through some non-trivial, uh, in a non-trivial way. So um, um, if we were able to prove one of this conjecture, perhaps we could uh, find out what is the underlying reason for why these different statements of quantum gravity are true. Okay, and we'll go over some of these conjectures today. Now, the first question you may ask is, since this criteria, this Wormland criteria, do not follow from purely low energy effective field theory considerations alone by definition. If you can do that, then they are not Swarmland criteria. So why are they necessary for the consistencies of quantum gravitational theories? So in a paper last year with Hicho Kim and Kumun Bafa, we initiate a program of using brain probes to understand, um, to understand um, Swarmland criteria and uh, I will briefly sketch the idea here. So while this is not the main point of my talk, um, it's nice to see how the notion of the swamland can be established in some concrete setting. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, turns out that some of the swamland criteria are invisible from a point particle point of view. Um, but they are visible when we try to couple the theory when, when, but they are visible when we try to probe the theories with extended objects. So the idea is to use the completeness of the spectrum of states to test the consistencies of EFT coupled to gravity. So what is this completeness hypothesis? The completeness hypothesis states that for every state in the charge, uh, for every charge states that is allowed by direct quantization, they should exist in the theory. So there's no unoccupied charge states if the theory can be consistently coupled to gravity. So one way to make use of this completeness hypothesis is to look at what do you have in your gravitational theory. For example, if your gravitational theory contains a two form, the completeness hypothesis would imply that there are string one dimensional objects that couple to this two form just like a particle would couple to, uh, uh, to a one-form gauge field, a, a string would couple to a two-form field. So the two-form field in this gravitational theory transform under local gauge and Lorentz symmetries. As a result, the action of the string is no longer invariant under this transformation. And this leads to an anomaly inflow. There's some anomaly inflow onto these strings. Now you can check whether this anomaly inflow can be canceled by local anomalies in a unitary well shift theory. So if you could cancel this anomaly in a unitary way uh, by the degrees of freedom on this string object, then there should be no issue. But if this cancellation cannot occur, the theory is inconsistent because strings which must exist in this object according to the completeness hypothesis holds an anomaly. So to test this idea, uh, we first consider um, 10 and six dimensional gravitational theories uh, with minimal supersymmetries. And this is because uh, gauge and gravitational anomalies severely limited the possibilities. As you have seen in 10 dimensions, gauge and gravitational anomalies boil down to only four possibilities, four possible gauge groups. So we have a better chance of uh, looking at this smaller set of theories and see what exactly would go wrong for theories that we don't know how to realize in uh, string theory. Uh, I should, however, emphasize that the same method can be used to constrain four-dimensional theories. Although gauge and gravitational anomalies are less restrictive in four dimensions, and there are, clear, there are no clear targets. So there are quite a lot of examples we could uh, try to study and it would be hard to put them into, 
into this subset of landscape theories versus swampland theories. Whereas as you will see, in 10 dimensions and six dimensions, um, the set of consistent anomaly-free theories are somewhat limited, and we can still try to put them into different camps. Now, we, in the paper last year, we illustrated the power of this approach with just only a few examples. Uh, we really have not done an exhaustive uh, demonstration of the power of this work of this approach, and we have only used string probes. Namely, the theory contains only two forms or multiple of them, and we can use multiple string probes to test the consistency of the theories. But we expect this program of using not only string probes, but brain probes to understand swarmland criteria has a much wider applicability. And as a first step, uh, we show that indeed, the 10 dimensional uh, anomaly free uh, supergravity theories with funny gauge group, gauge group with large U1 factors, E8 times U1 to the 248 or U1 to the 496, um, which have no string realization so far, are indeed in the swarmland. In the sense that you will find that there are string-like objects, because these theories also have two forms, there are string-like objects uh, whose anomaly inflow cannot be canceled in a unitary way. So in the sense that I explained before, they are inconsistent, but the inconsistencies cannot be detected with just point particles. You would have to look further and indicate, in this case, looking further means that looking at the consistencies of the strings that live in the theory. Now, moving on to four, six dimensions, there are, in fact, known infinite families of anomaly-free um, uh, supergravity theories. There are infinite families of them, and they are typically characterized by an unbound rank for the gauge group. So a bunch of SUN, for instance, with N arbitrary large, um, or these theories contain an unbounded number of tensor multiplets. In six dimensions, there are also tensor multiplets, and that could be infinitely many of them uh, in this infinite families of anomaly three supergravity theories, or the theory may contain matter in rather exotic representations. And so using this method, we show that unitarity of the current algebra on the strain probes uh, can rule out some of these infinite families. So in the same sense, you, you look at the theories and see that there are many um, there are many string like objects and you can test whether the anomaly inflow can be canceled in a unitary way. Turn out many of them cannot. So um, now this is just the basic idea uh, and I will refer you to our paper for the details. So there could potentially be a lot more uh, applications of this idea to rule out even more infinite families of seemingly consistent uh, anomaly free uh, gravitational theories. So in a way, we have established the existence of the swarmland, at least in some uh, higher dimensional setting, 10 dimensions and six dimensions. Uh, there are theories that are seemingly consistent according to all the rules of QFT, but they are secretly inconsistent and we can detect why they are inconsistent using brain probes. So knowing that we, uh, the swarmland, uh, well, in a way we have established the existence of the swarmland, uh, we could now revisit some of the conjectures about quantum gravity. Okay. So the most well-known conjectures, uh, the most well-known conjecture of quantum gravity is perhaps the statement that exact global symmetries do not exist in theories that can be coupled consistently to gravity quantum mechanically. And there are many ways to motivate this conjecture. For example, we could argue heuristically uh, from black hole physics. So you can think of this as a thought experiment. Um, so the Hawking radiation of a black hole is insensitive to the, uh, to the uh, global charges carries. So you could imagine throwing uh, global charges into a black hole. Now you have black holes with different global charges uh, as this black holes with different global charges Hawking radiate the mass, uh, you end up having infinitely many stable states. And this is thermodynamic, and this infinitely many stable states are within a finite mass range after the, Hawking, the black holes Hawking radiate its mass. And so this is thermodynamically problematic. Having infinitely many stable states with a mass below a certain uh, 
uh, uh, mass scale would imply that the entropy violates the entropy bound. So indeed, uh, in string theory, as far as we know, all the symmetries are gauged. Okay. So within the context of perturbative heterotic string, um, and also if the gravitational theories emit a holographic dual, one can even construct proof for these statements. Namely, in a somewhat more restricted setting, if you are describing the theory within the perturbative string framework, or when you are in the context of ADS-CFT, you could prove that um, global exact global symmetries are incompatible with uh, quantum gravity. Now, this conjecture has, even though it looks very simple, it has many phenomenological uh, implications. For example, you can use this conjecture to argue that if the dark matter particle carries a tiny electric charge, there is necessarily a new massless gauge boson. So the argument is very simple. The argument is basically that if the dark matter sector carries a charge that is not quantized with respect to the electric charge E, you can construct neutral operators purely from the standard model fields or purely from the dark matter fields. And as a result, there is a global symmetry acting only on the dark sector, which, as we argue, cannot exist. Um, and, in quantum gravity unless the symmetry is gauged. Okay, so that means that whenever you find that there is a charged particle uh, that is not quantized with respect to the electric charge, you are necessarily going to find a new massless gauge boson that come along as well. So this is um, the no global symmetry conjecture. What about the weak gravity conjecture then? So the weak gravity conjecture can be thought of as an upgrade of the no global symmetry conjecture. Why is that the case? Well, since global symmetries can be thought of as gauge symmetries with a vanishing gauge coupling. So it is natural to suspect problems to arise when the coupling constant becomes too weak. So when the coupling becomes too weak, you are in the we, we are recovering a global symmetry. So that should be an obstruction of making the theory weaker and weaker. And there should be a lower bound on how weak that coupling constant may be. And the question is, uh, uh, when do things go wrong? When, when you dial down the gauge coupling, when do you start to see problems? And how, what problems do you see when the gauge coupling is below a certain bound. Um, obviously, you cannot take the coupling constant to zero because that will prove global symmetry, which we already said is a problem. But how we, can the coupling be? So the weak barrier conjecture formalizes this suspicion that we cannot take the coupling to be arbitrary weak by postulating that gravity is the weakest force. So it's an easy slogan to remember, but of course, this is only a scale dependent statement. As you know, the strength of gravity grows as a power law in the ultraviolet, whereas the strength of gauge interaction runs only logarithmically. So at high enough energies, the gravitational coupling would uh, always come to dominate over the gauge coupling. However, as you will see, the weak gravity conjecture comes equipped with a uh, you be cut off. And so this situation will not arise. So even though naively, you could always crank up your, you can always go to high and high in energy. One grows as a power law, namely gravity, and one grows only as a law. At some point, high enough energy, gravity always becomes the stronger force. So this statement cannot be true at all scale. But the weak gravity conjecture comes in a very, with a very clever ultraviolet cutoff that we call the magnetic weak gravity cutoff. Because of that cutoff, you never go into the regime where gravity is stronger. And so with this UV cutoff, gravity remains the weakest force. So what the weak gravity conjecture is, is, uh, is really a condition on the spectrum of charge states. So it requires that for every long range gauge fields, there exists a state whose charge to mass ratio is bigger than one or more precisely, 
the charge to mass ratio of an extremal black hole. So uh, I was schematically called the charge to mass ratio of an extremal black hole as quote unquote one sometimes in order to simplify the formula. And just to establish some terminology here, we will from now on refer to states that satisfies this inequality as super extremal because of this bigger than sign and states that saturates this, ine this inequality um, are extremal states, whereas states that violate this inequality are sub-extremal states. So this equal or bigger than or equal sign refers to super extremal and extremal states. Now, this is sometimes, um, um, so this is sometimes known as the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture because we only require the existence of some states satisfying this inequality without any specification on what that state might be. And if you notice, the weak gravity conjecture, even the mild form, would imply that extremal black hole can decay. And this is because an extremal black hole can decay through emitting one of these super extremal states. It now becomes kinematically possible for the black hole to decay into smaller things by emitting states that are super extremal. The only exception is when the black hole is uh, protected by a symmetry, as in the case of a BPS black holes. In this, in this case, because of the symmetries, um, the extremal black holes still uh, does not decay, despite the fact that there may exist super extremal or extremal states in the theory. Now, this is uh, the electric version of the weak gravity conjecture because the states that are charged under the coupling here are electrically charged. Um, but nothing prevents us from applying this bound to magnetic objects and noting that the magnetic monopole has a mass and a charge that scales with the electric coupling in the way that is shown in the PowerPoint here, we can infer that there is a UV cutoff. The ultraviolet cutoff implied by the magnetic weak gravity conjecture is parametrically weaker than the Planck scale at weak coupling. So when the coupling is weak, when G is small, this cutoff is significantly below the Planck scale. Now, if you are a string theorist, you would immediately recognize what is this magnetic weak gravity cutoff. This magnetic weak gravity conjecture cutoff is the string scale, the scale at which a finite number of uh, uh, field content would not be sufficient. You have to bring in this infinite towers of states. And so the string scale is indeed weaker than the Planck scale by a factor of the coupling. And as you can see, because of that magnetic weak gravity conjecture cutoff. Um, you could not crank up the coupling to arbitrary high value when gravity dominates, so gravity remains the weakest force. Now this is the weak gravity conjecture for particles. We could generalize the weak gravity conjecture uh, to requiring that for every uh, P form, P plus one form gauge field, there exists a p-brain whose charge to tension ratio is bigger than that of an extremal brain. Okay? So in terms of an equation, it tells you that the charge QP over the tension of that p, uh, that p uh, brain should be bigger than some number that is set by the extremal object. The weak gravity conjecture stated earlier was for a zero form symmetry the zero brain that couples to a one form gauge fields um, are the point particles. Um, you could go up and down in dimensions for these brains. Uh, you could consider higher dimensional brains, membranes, and so on. But you could also go lower in dimensions. The most interesting case for this weak gravity, P form weak gravity conjecture is P equals to minus one. Um, the P minus, P equals to minus form uh, weak gravity conjecture um, is uh, most interesting because as we will see, it constrains axion inflation. But as we will also see, this is also most subtle. Um, the reason is that the minus one 
strength that coupled to a zero form gauge field, namely an axion, are instantons, which have no clear notions of extremality and decay. Um, nonetheless, indirect arguments suggest that we can still extrapolate this weak gravity bound to the p equals to minus one form case. And the arguments are indirect. For example, you could um, try to map a minus one form symmetry to a zero form symmetry, to more familiar zero form symmetry by dualities. Sometimes you could find a duality frame like t-duality that you can start from a minus one form symmetry and uh, an axion and turn it into a one form symmetry, uh, the usual gauge view. Or you could ob obtain um, a, a minus one form symmetry by dimensionally reducing the usual uh, gauge fields. Um, so this indirect ar argument suggests that the above inequality is still true when we exp extrapolate it to p equals to minus one. Now, um, the weak gravity conjecture for the minus form, minus one form uh, takes the form of an inequality. It takes the form of an upper bound on the product of the axion decay constant and the instanton action. So you can roughly think of the inverse of the axion decay constant as the charge and the instanton action as roughly the mass or the tension. So indeed, the minus one form weak gravity conjecture takes um, a form similar to what we have seen before for particles and in general for p brains. Now in the recent work, we gave a more direct argument for the minus one form weak gravity conjecture by setting the extremal bound to be given by the action to charge ratio of a macroscopic semi wormholes. And intuitively, you can understand the weak gravity conjecture as demanding that the transition process, the tunneling uh, process through a collection of small instantons um, dominates over the process through a single large instanton with the same charge. This sounds a bit abstract, so maybe we can gain some intu intuition on how the axionic weak gravity conjecture comes about. So here, uh, I can present you an example uh, where you can indirectly obtain the weak gravity conjecture bound for axions through um, dimensional reductions, one of the indirect arguments that I mentioned before. So to see how an axionic weak gravity conjecture can come from the usual weak gravity conjecture in terms of one form gauge field, you could consider a five dimensional gauge theory. A five dimensional gauge theory um, and compactify the theory on a circle. So the fifth component of the, the fifth component of the gauge field becomes a four dimensional axion. And the shift symmetry of the axion descends from the five dimensional gauge symmetry. Um, now, the instantons that breaks the shift symmetries are topologically non trivial Euclidean configurations. You can think of them, think, think of these instantons as the well lines of charged particles going around the compact circle. So now we have mapped both the axion and the instantons into something that we could recognize in the five dimensional picture. In other words, the uh, instanton action, which controls the suppression of the non-perturbatively generated potential, and the axion periodicity, namely the axion decay constant, can be expressed in terms of the mass and the charge of the five-dimensional particles. Just to quickly recap, even though we may not know uh, how to formulate the weak gravity conjecture for axion directly, if we can map this axion instanton system to something that we can recognize in five dimensional, five dimensional picture, then we can demand a weak gravity conjecture in five dimension. And we find that by setting the mass to be smaller than the charge in appropriate unit in five dimension, the weak gravity conjecture turned into an upper bound 
on the product of the axion decay constant and the instanton action. So this tells us that when the axion decay constant is large, when the axion periodicity is large, the instanton action is small in uh, Planck units. And so the higher instanton corrections are not suppressed. And this would be a point that we will come back to shortly. So are there any questions at this point before I go on to, uh, to some of the cosmological implications of the weak gravity? Is that questions? Yeah. To the participants, please ask question. He is switching to the new topic. If you have, I think there is a one question in the chat box. Yes. Uh, uh, you can see or? I cannot, but if you can read to me, that would be great. Oh, okay. So, I don't know uh, what is the connection. Maybe you can tell me. So has the amplitude hadron approach been useful in M theory? Has the amplitude hadron approach been useful in M theory? Is that the question? Yeah. So uh, it is somewhat unrelated to what I'm going to say. Yeah. Although I, will I will still use amplitude techniques uh, shortly when I present a a proof of the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. I would be using unitarity and causality and all kinds of amplitude uh, techniques to draw statements. Um, but at the moment, I think amplitude hadron is much more, much broader than that. It's a it's a set of um, ideas that uh, constrains the form of the amplitude. Um, so whether we are applying this to to M theory or not. I mean, it depends on whether we also include gravitational uh, degrees of freedom in calculating these amplitudes. Some of the studies are uh, uh, restricted to say, um, uh, am amplitudes involving only gauge degrees of freedom, in which case I don't see a direct connections to, to, to M theory. Um, Gary, I have a question probably yeah. from one. Hey, Sarah. Oh, hi, how are you? Good. Um, so going back to your example with the axion going from 5D to 4D, so it looks like in a particular case that you would, it looks like you have a very nice one, kind of a one-to-one -one map between what you would learn in five dimensions and in four dimensions. Right. Well, it might be interesting if there was a difference <laughs> and yes. if you could yes. learn more, say, in the four-dimensional picture than then to tell you something about the five-dimensional. So could you see that in this example or? Yeah, so I think in this example, you would be able to fix what we mean by one in this equation, right? Because the extremality is easy to work out in the 5D theory. And if you follow the duality map or the dimension reduction maps, you would be able to not only get an order one relation, but you would be able to fix the precise order one factor. Um, I think, the, um, I like this argument in the sense that it gives you a very clear intuitive picture of why there's a minus one form weak gravity conjecture. The weakness of this approach is you always need a crutch. Uh, either there exists a duality frame where we can make your argument or the axion has to come from a dimensionally reduced gauge field. Um, so uh, I was very brief in making a reference to this paper. And in this paper, we were studying the uh, uh, wormhole solutions in axion gravity and axion dilaton gravity. And in a very parallel way to what we find for one form gauge fields, uh, you can see that the higher derivative corrections to, to, um, to this axion gravity systems tend to tilt the action uh, to charge ratio in a way that is preferred by the weak gravity conjecture. So that's how we could try to formulate this extremality bound in terms of the action to charge ratio of a macroscopic semi wormhole. In other words, we compute the action to charge ratio of a semi wormhole as a number. When you include higher derivative corrections, the weak gravity conjecture is supposedly tilted in the right way. And we find that indeed it tilted in the right way. And so this gives us some uh, more direct measure of what we mean by the weak gravity bound. There we will also be able to fix this order one number. And 
Um, I think in examples where we can embed this axion gravity system in multiple ways, for instance, by getting this axion gravity system directly from dimension reduction, we can cross check whether these two numbers are match up or not. And the difficulty really is in most of this dimension reduced system or system that emits duality groups, the um, number of degrees of freedom is much more than just gravity plus axion. So you have to eliminate a lot of these unwanted materials before we can go on and do the checks. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions, please? There, there, there is something in the screen. Uh, it's not me, but uh, it doesn't bother me too much. <laughs> yeah. if, you can, if you can get rid of them, that would be great. But otherwise, I would just move on. Seeing that in another talk, actually, the same problem appeared. <laughs> they didn't know why. You could, I think if you uh, stop sharing and then share again, it will go away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so should I do that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, now it disappeared. <laughs> Great. So now this is a small uh, intermission. Um, the weak gravity conjecture was uh, proposed in 2006. That was a long while ago. But there has been a resurgence of interest in the weak gravity conjecture, mainly due to its potential implications to cosmology. And so before I present some evidence for the weak gravity conjecture, I think it's instructive to um, mention some of its cosmological implications. Uh, in particular, uh, it's it, uh, using the weak gravity conjecture in constraining inflation. Now, as you know, inflation, in addition to generate density perturbations, also generate gravitational wave. Although whether we can detect them depends on the scale of inflation. So there's an ongoing global experimental effort trying to detect primordial gravitational waves imprinted on the CMBB modes. Um, this interest is that a detection at the targeted level could potentially give us a glimpse of quantum gravity. Um, the reason is, under some assumptions, and I can quantify what they are, a detectable BMO would suggest that the infraton potential is nearly flat over a super Planckian field range, a field range that is bigger than the Planck scale. So without a symmetry that is respected by Planck scale physics, the infraton potential is subject to uncontrollable corrections. As we integrate out the heavy degrees of freedom that coupled to the infraton, the infraton potential receives infinitely many corrections. And usually we don't worry too much about such corrections, but this is not the case when the infraton field range is super pumpkin. It is bigger than the cutoff scale of the theory. And so the potential uh, could look very different as the field traverse over a long field range, uh, long uh, field range in field space. So for this reason, uh, axions have been a popular candidate for large field inflation. Inflation that involve delta phi, the field range to be bigger than the Planck scale. And by axions, I don't mean the QCD axion, but any number goes on, any pseudo number goes on bosons with a perturbative shift symmetry would be called an axion in my book. So um, 
because of the perturbative shift symmetry, there's a flat direction. Um, there's no potential along this direction. Non-perturbative effects breaks this continuous shift symmetry to a discrete one because the potential is now only uh, invariant under discrete shift. And the field range uh, denoted here as two pi f defines what we mean by the axion decay constant. The bigger the axion decay constant is, the longer the field range of the axion. Now, the potential generated by this non-perturbative effect is uh, flat enough for, poten for inflation if the axion field range f is bigger than the Planck scale. So we can see from this picture, as I make f larger and larger, the potentials become flatter and flatter. And the criteria for this potential to be suitable for inflation is when this axion decay constant f is super Planckian. Now, what is shown here is only the leading instanton term. And um, the higher harmonics, the higher instanton effects, which, which reduce the axion field range, are uh, suppressed exponentially by the instanton action. And they can be neglected if the instanton action is large. So even though in principle, the potential is not just a simple uh, cosine functions with periodicity 2 pi f, there could be a lot of higher order corrections that reduce the field range. Um, if you could somehow ignore these high instanton effects, then you're done. This would be your potential. Okay. However, the weak gravity conjecture suggests that these two conditions cannot be simultaneously satisfied. We have seen that when the axion decay constant is big, the instanton action has to become small to respect the weak gravity bound, and as a result, um, we may lose analytic control. Now, naively, this weak gravity bound that we find uh, rule out natural inflation, but we were also among the first to point out the loopholes. Um, the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture, as I stated, only requires some, but not all, instantons to satisfy the weak gravity bound. So the weak gravity bound being the product of the axion decay constant and the instanton action to be smaller than one in Planck units. Um, so one can imagine a situation that in addition to the instanton that generates the infraton potential, there's another instanton that gives a negligible contributions to the potential. So this is the one that drives inflation. There's an additional contributions with a, an exponentially small contributions. And if the instanton action of this extra instanton is very, very large, you can basically ignore it. But in the presence of this extra spectator instantons, the weak gravity bound can be satisfied without affecting the inflationary dynamics. So that's one of the loopholes. It's not that the weak gravity conjecture can rule out complete natural inflation. You can imagine that there's a scenario when this could happen. Another loophole of Axion inflation is uh, axial monodromy inflation, uh, where the axions are non periodic. So, unlike the usual axions, a monodromy axion um, does not have a compact field space, so its field range is not limited by the axion decay constant. So, in picture, this is how the axion field space looks like for a monodromy axion. Um, instead of a compact field space, it opens up. So the, how far the axion can go is not limited by the periodicity set by the axion decay constant. So you could also see why the weak gravity conjecture does not apply because here, because the axion field space is non-compact, the uh, axion has a mass and it is mapped to a massive gauge field if there is such a duality frame where the uh, axion becomes a massive uh, one form gauge field, uh, which does not lead to a long range force. And so the uh, weak gravity conjecture that I stated earlier does not immediately apply. Now there are several ways you can, uh, you can, um, uh, there are several ways in which the weak gravity conjecture can be upgraded to stronger forms. Uh, so, so far I've only talked about a single U1, uh, but if you have multiple U1s, uh, having a state whose charge to mass ratio 
is bigger than that of an extremal black hole in each of the charge direction, is not enough to guarantee that uh, a black hole with general charges can decay. So for example, in the picture on the right, you see that I have a state whose charge to mass ratio is bigger than the extremal bound. But if I have a black hole carrying charge along this charge direction, uh, they cannot decay because there's simply no uh, decay product that are allowed by the theory. So the um, so it takes a moment of it takes a moment of thought to realize that the requirement for an extremal black hole to decay is to demand that the convex hull generated by the charge to mass vectors of states in the theory to be big enough to contain the extremal ball to ex contain the black hole region. So um, this is the convex hull generated by the charge to mass vectors of the states. It's not big enough to contain the black hole region, so it violated weak gravity conjecture. But on the picture in the left, um, I have certain charged states, and I could form this convex hull, and it is big enough to contain the entire black hole region. So the picture on the left is compatible with the weak gravity conjecture in, with multiple U1 gauge fields. Now, this brings us to an even stronger form of the weak gravity conjecture. So it turns out internal consistencies suggest even further upgrades. So if you compactify a theory on a circle, you would get an additional U1, namely the kaluza klein U1. So you could consider uh, black holes carrying charges under the U1 that was already there before the compactification and this additional KKU1. So this would be an example of a, of, um, of the two, of a two uh, U1 system. Uh, on the x-axis here is the U1 that was present before the compactification. And on the y-axis is the U1 that you get by reducing a higher dimensional theory. So you come, uh, uh, by compactifying the theory, it comes along with an infinite tower of kaluza klein states whose charge to mass ratio um, depends on the radius. So the convex how is not guaranteed to contain the black hole region. So it may well be that for a large enough radius, the convex how condition is satisfied. Uh, namely, the infinite tower of kaluza klein states have charge to mass ratio that are big enough to contain the black hole region. But when you reduce the radius at some point, the uh, convex how would uh, have some uh, would uh, would not be big enough that some black holes would be missed, and so this picture on the right would correspond to, to situations where the convex hull condition is not satisfied. Because of that, um, uh, we are motivated to upgrade the weak gravity conjecture to a stronger form, known as the tower or the sublattice weak gravity conjecture. So to not labor you with the details, but the stronger forms of the weak gravity conjecture means is that um, there should be an infinitely many states in the charge lattice that are populated with extremal or super extremal states. So there are infinitely many super extremal particles or extremal particles required in order to make the theory consistent with kaluza klein compactification. Now this uh, uh, stronger form of the weak gravity conjecture have been used to um, to uh, rule out uh, axion models of axion inf model of large field inflation with multiple axions. So many ideas have been proposed. For example, the idea of M inflation uh, is to inflate along some diagonal uh, in field space, and thereby gaining a factor of root n. So even if the field range is limited to be subplanking in each of the directions, um, the idea of inflation is to go along some diagonal and that can you a factor of root n. And if you have a large number of axions, you may be able to get by uh, beyond uh, Planck scale distances. Um, the alignment or clockwork mechanism exploits approximate shift symmetry of a multi-axion potential. And as a result, because of this approximate shift symmetry, there's a long effective field range. Um, naively, the weak gravity conjecture uh, rule out these models. Uh, you can see it from the convex Hull condition or from the 
uh, tower weak query conjecture that I just mentioned. But again, one can come up with loopholes. Okay? So for example, one can imagine a very contrived situations uh, where all the sites of a charge lattice are populated by marginally ex uh, super extremal states. So all the dots here are the allowed charge states uh, in the theory, and they're populated by states that are very, very close to extremal, except two that are very super extremal, meaning that the mass is much smaller than this charge. And as a result, if you were com to compute the potential generated by all these instantons, these two instantons would dominate. And as a result, just like the picture on the uh, left, you could uh, generate a very um, flat potential and with a super Planckian effective free range without upsetting the inflationary dynamics. The contributions from all the other instantons are so small that uh, they do not compete with the contributions coming from these two guys. You notice that this is nothing but the spectator instanton ideas that I mentioned earlier. So if you can find a way to make all these instanton corrections uh, giving you a negligible effect, then you could still write down a model of large field inflation um, and yet be compatible with the weak gravity conjecture. So the point here is that while the weak gravity conjecture cannot completely rule out axion inflation, models that come that models that satisfied it uh, come with a lot of bells and whistles, and we can sometimes uh, turn these problems into virtues. For example, the spectator instantons um, generate some small wiggles in the potential. So even though they are negligible, they give a negligible contributions to the potential, there's still a small effect. On top of a very smooth potential, there's some small modulations generated by these spectator instantons. These wiggles are quite interesting from a cosmology point of view, um, as in axial monodromy inflation with potentials that are not entirely smooth, but with wiggles, um, you could see in addition to, you could see in addition to the usual uh, cosmological observable that uh, they would also generate some uh, significant non-Gaussianity. And the non-Gaussianity generated by the wiggles of the potential is in a form that is quite interesting. Um, the, uh, um, instead of the usual squeeze limit or the collateral triangle limit, um, the non-Gaussianity generated by, by these modulations in the potentials uh, leads to also modulations in the three-point functions of the uh, uh, perturbations. And you could try to even look for such signatures uh, from or signatures of non gaussianity experimentally. So having given you uh, some uh, discussion about the implications of the weak gravity conjecture to cosmology, um, I think we are all now motivated to look for evidence for why this is true. By independent lines of arguments have given uh, support to the weak gravity conjecture, um, uh, for example, there is an interesting, intriguing, and somewhat surprising relations between the weak gravity conjecture and the cosmic censorship conjecture. Um, the presence of a weak gravity particle, the one, the super extremal particle that I mentioned before, uh, can avoid uh, us seeing a naked singularity in a certain Einstein Maxwell system that has been studied by, by these um, authors. So, um, and um, Instead of going through these arguments, this instead of going through that the, all these different sort of evidence one by one, let me highlight um, uh, a subset of these ideas that have been explored, starting with attempts to prove the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. So, so the. Um, the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture requires only some state for an extremal black hole to decay to. Right? We only required something to satisfy the inequality uh, for the weak gravity conjecture to hold. This is what we meant by the mild form when we haven't specified what that state might be. So a natural question to ask is whether extremal themselves can satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. 
So that would be a very economical solution. Not only, not only we don't necessarily have to find a particle in the low energy theory uh, to check that it satisfies the weak gravity bound. Uh, we could see whether black holes themselves can do the job. Now the notion of extremality is subject to corrections. For instance, loop corrections and higher derivative corrections can change the extremal bound. Uh, in particular, higher derivative corrections to the Einstein-Maxwell theory can correct the black hole solutions and modify the extremality bound. Now these corrections, if they are higher derivative corrections, they are suppressed by the mass of the black holes. Uh, for very massive black holes, these corrections are tiny. However, this is not the case for smaller black holes. So this idea was uh, suggested a while back, shortly after the weak gravity paper by these authors. So in other words, if you consider an extremal black hole, a very large extremal black hole, this would be the extremal bound. Higher derivative corrections can change it slightly. It can tilt this line uh, downwards or upwards. And the effect would be so tiny when you look at very large black holes that it asymptotes to the classical extremality bound. So it was shown that for some four dimensional extremal black holes in the heterotic string, uh, we got a curve something like, we got a curve like A. So the charge to mass ratios become bigger for smaller extremal black holes. So this is only a case by case study. So the question is, if we can show that the higher derivative corrections can always increase the extremality bound, can always increase the charge to mass ratio of the extremality bound, then a large black hole can decay to several smaller ones. So uh, in this paper with uh, Yuta and Tushifumi, uh, we show that this behavior, namely the increase of the charge to mass ratio of the extremality bound in some wide classes of theories follow simply, follow simply from unitarity and causality. So obviously we do not uh, prove these statements in full generality. Um, so to what extent our proof applies? We will assume throughout our discussion, a weakly coupled UV completion of quantum gravity. Okay, what does that mean? Well, there is uh, some, let's say there's some energy scale lambda QFT above which the ordinary QFT description breaks down. In string theory, you can think of this lambda QFT as a string scale above which there are infinitely many um, local fields. But even so, at lambda QFT at the string scale, the theory is still weakly coupled for perturbative string theory. So we will assume that the UV completion for the classes of theory that's, that we study, we assume that the UV completion is similar to what we find in the perturbative uh, string theory. Namely, at lambda QFT, we assume that the theory is still weakly coupled. So we find that extremal black holes themselves can satisfy the weak gravity conjecture in at least two classes of theory. The first class of theories are those with light neutral scalars below lambda QFT. So these are the light particles. Um, Again, if you're a string theorist, you can think of this like scalar fields as the dilaton or other modulized stabilized below the Planck's, uh, below the string scale, below lambda QFT. Now, even if there are no like states below lambda QFT, suppose there's a desert between your low energy degrees of freedom, namely the photon and the graviton, and this scale beyond which you don't how, know how to describe with ordinary QFT framework. Um, if the UV completion um, contains photon and graviton that are accompanied by different towers of higher spin states, then our uh, statement that I'm going to outline for you still works. And this is indeed the case when you have a theory with open strings. So in theories with open strings, there's a tower of higher spin states associated with the photon. And in fact, all the gauge fields have their tower and the graviton have their own tower. Now, since we are considering the decay of a very large black hole, we can go to the deep infrared where the black hole dynamics is described by an effective field theory of the massless degrees of freedom, namely the photon and the graviton. So let's start with a, a simple system. Let's say we are considering how the weak gravity conjecture uh, 
is satisfies for the Einstein-Maxwell theory. Um, the low energy effective action in four dimensions contains the usual Einstein Hilbert term, the kinetic term for the gauge fields. And there are many higher derivative operators you can write down as corrections to this action. In four dimension, in fact, you can write down eight four derivative operators as leading corrections to the action of the Einstein-Maxwell theory. And these eight operators are listed here. Um, we can use the equation of motion to recast these operators into three terms to make our analysis simpler. So these three terms are as follows. There's a term that goes like f to the fourth. There's an f f dual square term. And there's a term involving the wire tensor. Now, there are several ways to write this high derivative terms using the equation of motion. And we find this gauge to be particularly convenient. Uh, as you'll see, the argument can be made much more easily in a frame where the higher derivative terms are of this form. Okay. You can, of course, write it in other form you like. The physics does not change. But um, we find it most convenient to make our argument using this basis. So as I said, this higher derivative corrections would modify the black hole solution. So the charge to mass ratio of an extremal black hole is modified. So one is the classical extremal bound, the charge to mass ratio of a black hole, extremal black hole. There are some corrections that are inversely proportional to the charge or the mass of the black hole. For a very large black hole, this is a small effect. And you can ignore some higher order effects that you could possibly write down. And the leading um, correction is sufficient. We can stop at the leading order if the higher derivative terms are small, which is the case when the black hole is sufficiently heavy or when it is very, very charged. Okay. So proving the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture, therefore, amounts to proving an inequality. Namely, we want the high derivative corrections to increase the charge to mass ratio. So this Wilson coefficients that parameterize the high derivative effects must be bigger than or equal to one. So in the following few minutes, I will show that this, inequal uh, this bound with a strict inequality uh, follows from unitarity and causality, at least for the classes of theories that I mentioned. Now, the proof may be a little bit technical. Uh, so let me just briefly sketch the argument. Again, the details can be uh, found in our paper. But I would like to give you just a gist of how we make this argument. So the proof consists of two steps. Uh, we first show that for the aforementioned theories, theories that uh, either have like scalars or they have different towers of higher spin states, uh, causality would imply that there is a hierarchy in the Wilson coefficients. So recall that alpha 1 parameterized f to the fourth term. Alpha 3 is the term that involves the wild tensor. And these two terms are uh, the one that controls the weak gravity bound. Um, so the reason is that causality, uh, the, the reason is that the uh, derivative terms involving the wild tensor leads to causality violation. And it was argued that an infinite tower of higher spin states, uh, just like string theory, is used, is needed to UV complete the theory. Okay. Um, now, a simple way to see how uh, an FFW coupling, this high derivative coupling, leads to causality violation is to consider a photon propagating in a gravitational short wave background. And uh, in addition to the usual time delay in general relativity, this FFW coupling um, leads to a helicity-dependent phase shift. FFW is the coupling of the photons with, the, with gravity. And so this gives you a phase shift of this photon in a short wave background that depends on the helicity of the field. And so one of these helicity modes experience a time advance rather than a time delay. So the minus sign corresponds to a time advance and the, plus sign corresponds to a time delay, just like the time delay is similar to that in general relativity. So here, B is the impact parameter. And for small enough impact parameter, or equivalently at high enough energy, this uh, helicity-dependent phase shifts dominate. 
And so one of these modes would give you a time advance and you can pretty much ignore the general relativity time delay when this B is very large. So this time advance, which violate causality cannot be, um, cannot be, um, cannot be solved if the theories cannot be cured if the theory that you consider has particle with spin two or below. Um, and this is because the phase shift generated by a spin J particle goes as S to the J minus one. So having only particle with spin two or below will not allow you to cure the time advance. And in fact, you can, after the moments of thought, you can convince yourself that a finer number of higher spin particles does not help either. So, however, uh, summing over an infinite tower of higher spin states sometimes can lead to softer behavior. As, in, as you can see from the rigid behavior of uh, string scattering amplitude. So um, this causality violation implies that uh, the ordinary QFT description with only a finite field content breaks down uh, above a scale that is set by this Wilson coefficient alpha three. Unless you bring in this infinitely many higher spin states, you violate causality. So, at the scale when you still have the ordinary QFT description with a finite field content, um, if you want to preserve causality, uh, it ought to relate to the scale at which the QFT description breaks down with the Wilson coefficient alpha three. So if your theory contains like scalars um, and integrating out this like scalar could give a significant contributions to the two Wilson coefficients that uh, do not violate causality, but not to the one that violate causality. In other words, we have our asserted hierarchy. One of the Wilson coefficient is much bigger. Now, even if there are no like scalar in the spectrum, um, if the theory, if the theory contains different higher spin towers, one associated with the photon and the other associated with the graviton, there is similarly a hierarchy. And this is because um, the open string coupling is parametrically weaker than the closed string coupling. So even though the masses of the states are all string scale, uh, the fact that the, the highest spin states associated with the photon has a uh, stronger coupling means that the Wilson coefficient generated by this infinite towers of highest spin states associated with the photon would give rise to a much bigger Wilson coefficient than the one that give rise to the uh, that give rise to the Wilson coefficient alpha three that violate causality. So alpha three is the Wilson coefficients that can only receive corrections from the highest spin states associated with the graviton. So you see that in both classes of theories, whether you have like degrees of freedom or when you have different towers of highest spin states, you come to the conclusion that one of the Wilson coefficient is much smaller than the other. So now the next step of the proof is rather simple because um, we just have to show that this alpha one, which parameterized that after the fourth time has to be positive. We could show the possibility of the after the fourth term by considering the forward limit of the photon scattering. Okay. So for the theories that we consider, um, the amplitude satisfies the so-called Frossard bound, meaning that the amplitude is bounded by, strictly bounded by S square in the ultraviolet. And on the other hand, the higher derivative operators parameterized by alpha one uh, give rise to an amplitude uh, of the order of S square. So unitarity therefore requires this Wilson coefficient alpha one to be positive. So combining these results, namely alpha one being positive and it is much bigger than the other Wilson coefficient, we come to the conclusion that um, uh, the high derivative uh, operators increase the charge to mass ratio of an extremal black hole. Um, the weak gravity state can be the extremal black hole themselves. So as a spin-off, um, we also show that in theories that satisfies the weak gravity conjecture, um, the leading high derivative operators always increase the entropy of an extremal black hole. And this results, which we gave um, in the appendix, is general and is not limited to the Einstein-Maxwell theory that I sketched for you in the previous slides. Um, the argument is basically that for extremal black holes, 
the leading entropy corrections come from the change in the horizon area. And if the higher derivative corrections can resolve the degeneracies of the inner and the outer horizon without introducing naked singularities, as the weak gravity conjecture suggests, then the horizon area should increase. However, this is not to say that the higher derivative corrections are guaranteed to increase the extremality bound. In other words, integrating our degrees of freedom uh, does not necessarily increase the black hole entropy. So as an example, we can consider adding a dilettante to the system that we studied previously, adding an extra dilettante to the Einstein Maxwell theory. And there are now seven instead of three leading higher derivative operators, leading four derivative operators um, uh, that you can write down. And as before, this higher derivative operators modify the uh, extremality bound. Okay. So we can con parameterize the contributions in terms of uh, the coefficients alpha i corresponding to the coefficients in the equation above and some functions that I'm not showing you in this slide here. Okay. So what we find, and it's quite interesting, is that unitarity requires one of this Wilson coefficient alpha 7 to be positive, but this function is negative, and that means that the operator alpha 7 of this form contributes negatively to the extremality bound. And this seems to go against the weak gravity conjecture. So we thought the higher degree correction should increase the extremality bound in order for extremal black holes to be the weak gravity state. So what's going on? Well, this operator does not appear in isolation. And indeed, in some well-motivated UV completions, for example, when the scalar, when the dilaton is the string dilaton, or when it is the radion in some collusive kind reduction, it turns out that the set of operators, not the single operator, the single operator still gives a negative contributions to extremality, but the set of operators combine to give a, uh, to shift the extremality bound positively. But this is still uh, somewhat unsatisfying because we are doing it in a case by case basis. If we know the UV completion is it's, uh, well motivated, we can check. Uh, is there some more general principle of ensuring that the weak gravity bound is satisfied? So in a recent paper with um, my student, Gregory Logis and Toshifumi Nomi, we um, examined how symmetries can impose additional structure on the EFT to ensure that the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. So uh, as an example, um, an SL2 our symmetry or an ODD symmetry can arise in the EF effective field theory. In other words, if you look at the, uh, the action here, there's no organizing principle for all these coefficients might be, but in can the presence of the symmetry. Can you give me again? You said that we order that's supposed to be evaluated. Yes. And I don't, find the, I don't find the email. I don't know what's the email. Maybe I, it's clear and it's sent it to you. Let me find oh, okay. it. I know there is a problem. Uh, okay. No, 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 it's okay. Let me go there. Ah, this is why I was there. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure if it's really because that was off on Monday. Yeah. These are the new books that are coming in. Yes. But even if there are ones for you, you have to Three stars. Can you? Yeah, that's really important. Of course, look, look. Uh, I think there might be. Yeah, 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 there I was mentioning that um, we look at how symmetries can impose additional structure in the EFT to ensure that the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. And as an example, you can uh, consider an SL2 R symmetry or an ODD symmetries, which can be present in the EFT involving the uh, Einstein Maxwell and the dilaton axion field. Uh, and in string theory, these are the S and T dualities respectively. 
And so these symmetries, when combined with either scattering amplitude positivity bounds or the null energy conditions are then strong enough to ensure to, to fulfill the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. And uh, we also explore the implications of supersymmetries. And remember, there are some puzzling terms that give a negative contributions to the extremality bound. We find that the puzzling terms which contribute negatively to the extremality are in fact needed in order to make sure that corrections to extremality is identically zero for BPS states. So the negative contributions like what we find here are there for a purpose. Okay. Um, now, the mild, showing that the weak gravity conjecture can be satisfied by some state is a good start. Uh, in a way, under some assumptions, we can prove the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. But the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture alone seems rather toothless. For example, you have seen that the minus one form weak gravity conjecture which constrains axion inflation can be satisfied by a spectator instanton or a whole bunch of spectator instantons. So could we somehow refine the weak gravity conjecture to stronger form? Can we make some uh, statements or at least suggest a proof of why the weak gravity conjecture should take stronger form? So um, the question is, could the existence of a super extremal black hole implied the existence of a tower of super extremal states, including some like states. And if there are some like states in the, in, in the spectrum that are super extremal, we close the gap for the weak gravity bound. So not only is the weak gravity conjecture satisfied by something that may not be visible from low energy, uh, the states that satisfy the weak gravity conjecture are part of the low energy theory. And if we can make such statements, that would be great. We could put the weak gravity conjecture in a much stronger form. But uh, naively, they have very different origins. We have strings in one regime, and we have black holes in another. And so having a super extremal black hole does not immediately tell us some light uh, string states that satisfies the weak gravity bound. Uh, however, with some additional assumptions, we can uh, get some mileage out of it. Uh, in this work with uh, Lars Ausmer and my student, former student Alex Koh, we show that uh, for black holes with a near horizon ADS3 geometry, we can use modular invariance and uh, the matching of anomalies to uh, show that there is a tower of super extremal states that interpolate between what you would call perturbative string states and black holes. Okay. So uh, let us start with the perturbative string states and try to build black holes from them. And for that, we can consider the one loop partition function of the well sheet uh, conformal field theory. Um, the partition function denoted by Z here enjoys modular invariance, which is the reparameterization symmetry. Uh, in addition, it's invariant under the U1 symmetry. Since we are considering the theory with uh, at least one U1 gauge field, the partition function is invariant under this U1 transformation, corresponding to the shift of uh, the corresponding to a shift of the chemical potential by an element of the dual charge lattice. This is nothing but demanding that the gauge group is compact uh, instead of the real line. Now, these transformations, the modular transformations together with the U1 transformation, uh, imply the following so-called spectral flow, which has the effect that if you start with a state with a given charge and mass, it would generate for you, the spectral flow would generate for you an infinite tower of states with different charges and with different masses. So this spectral flows, um, the, the, the states that are transformed under spectral flow, if you go to high enough masses, it, asym it has a charge to mass ratio that asymptotes to one. Uh, moreover, you can see that um, the string states in this infinite tower never crosses the asymptotic line. In other words, starting from a state whose charge to mass ratio is bigger than one, uh, spectral flow implies a tower of states that monotonically approaches the charge to mass ratio z equals to one from above. So this is a picture to keep in mind. 
this already looked like the curve that we wanted to show for the weak variety conjecture earlier, uh, except that we were looking at the region which has a very large charge and mass instead of looking at the low mass region. But the tendency of the curve to bend in the right way uh, seems to be suggestive uh, of the weak gravity conjecture. Now, this uh, still states in the perturbative strain, so this is strictly speaking the spectrum at zero coupling. Uh, if we turn on a small but non-zero coupling, uh, a highly excited string states will collapse into a black hole. And this is because above a critical coupling, which goes as n to the minus a quarter, where n is the excited level. When you go to higher and higher enough excited states, n is getting larger and larger. The critical coupling at which you can turn these string states into a black hole becomes smaller and smaller. And the reason why this is the critical coupling that turns strings into black hole is that uh, above this coupling, the size, you can show that the size of the string is less than its structural radius. So this suggests that the z equals to one line that I draw over here should be identified with the black hole extremality bound. Now, the black holes that are formed from the collapse in the way I described before are small black holes. This were uh, black holes formed from the collapse of the string states. They are small black holes. And so the string corrections are important. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the correspondence principle put forth by Horowitz and Polchinski suggests that the entropy of the strings should match with the beckenstein hawking entropy of the black hole that is formed uh, up to an order one factor. So in a sense, Strings are progenitors of black holes. So previously in the picture I drew in one regime, there are strings and in the other, there are black holes. They are not that different. Uh, however, this approximate matching uh, does not guarantee that this curve stays the same when we turn on the string coupling. Uh, this is because the mass spectrum gets shifted when the coupling is not zero. And we cannot be sure that the super extremal states that lie above the curve stay super extremal when the coupling is non-zero. But we can show more if, uh, if we make some further assumptions about these black holes. Um, uh, the near horizon geometry of a four dimensional extremal black hole is ADS2. But if the black hole arises from a compactification of a higher dimensional theory, um, one can oftentimes combine this ADS2 geometry with a compact S1 to form an ADS3 geometry. Now the black hole entropy uh, is with a near horizon ADS uh, three geometry has been argued the exact entropy of a black hole with an AD, uh, with a near horizon ADS three geometry has been argued uh, to be computed by the matching has been argued that it has uh, that can, that it can be computed by the matching of anomalies, okay. and the reason is that the black hole entropy is given by the Cardi's formula which depends on the central charge where the higher derivative corrections are encoded. So remember, we are looking at this small black may be important. And so this is a difficult problem. But if the central charges are where the higher derivative corrections are encoded, then if we know what, um, if we know how to compute the central charges, we would get still the entropy of the small black holes. And the point is that the central charges are fixed by anomalies. Only a finite number of higher derivative terms can contribute to these entropy charges. As a result, one can show that the entropy of this small black holes matches with the statistical entropy of the perturbative uh, heterotic string. So this exact matching uh, of the entropy suggests that uh, the, mass spectrum, the mass spectrum does not get shifted significantly when we turn on the string coupling. So the super extremal states can still stay super extremal at the string black hole transition. So this is the additional uh, ingredient that one uh, used in order to show that this feature is not spoiled when we turn on the string coupling, namely to make use of the near horizon ADS3 geometry and the matching of anomalies. So uh, showing that the weak query conjecture is satisfied by infinite tau of states is of course an improvement over the statement that I made before. But whether the weak variety conjecture can constrain inflation and other low energy physics depends on how densely these states are populated. So all we can say is that there is, a, 
there's a sub lattice or there's a tower of states that go infinitely far in the charged space that are occupied by super extremal states uh, using the module invariance and matching uh, module invariance argument that I made earlier you could uh, you could argue that there is an infinite tower um, there are infinitely many sites in the charge lattice that are populated by the super extremal states but uh, we don't know whether this would put a constraint on inflation unless we can show that the, the, uh, the states are densely populated with very few missing sites. So in an ongoing work, which we hope to complete uh, sometime this month uh, with Miguel Montero, we are using the module bootstrap to put a bound on the lightest charge states um, that satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. In particular, we wanted to know how sparse this lattice should be um, that is compatible with all the constraints that we know. Now, uh, since this is running late and I just want to sketch to you uh, some preliminary results. Um, so you can see that the missing site in the charge lattice form a discrete group. We can encode the CFT data um, into a group value partition function, which satisfies some modular properties. So uh, this gamma here takes elements of the discrete group and the module bootstrap turned this problem into a linear programming problem. And as an example, uh, suppose all the evenly charged states of the charge lattice are populated. Um, the, we find that the, let's take it as a starting point to run our module bootstrap argument, suppose all the evenly charged states are populated. Using the module bootstrap, we find that even the singly charged unit charged states in the lattice uh, satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. So the entire charge lattice is populated. So in this case, we see that um, the minimal charge object is one and the results for uh, more general cases are currently being investigated. So to summarize, the Swarmland program aims to identify which, conform, which quantum field theory uh, can be ultraviolet complete in uh, quantum gravity. And different Swarmland criteria uh, have been used to constrain the physics of inflation, um, the physics of dark matter, the physics of uh, dark energy and neutrinos. And I've only mentioned a subset uh, of these conjectures and the implications and much remains to be done to fully understand the origin and implications of consequences of this conjecture. So let me just stop here. Thank you for your attention. So please ask question. If you have question, please ask to the speaker. There is no question. I think people are feeling tired. <laughs> yeah, so this talk will be uh, up uploaded in YouTube and uh, the link I will share with you. And all of you, those who are already attending this series, you are uh, quite aware of that there is a channel and I'm going to post it there so you can actually uh, follow that uh, after uploading and if you have any specific question you may write to the speaker as well and he, he will be very happy to give you the answer because it is not just for now that's why this is recorded you can ask the question later as well so um, so it's it's we are very happy to have this kind of elaborative talk on this subject and it will be surely very helpful for all the students, researchers, those who are working or not working in this area to have some overview on this subject. And uh, we are really thankful to have you in this Zoominar series and uh, maybe in future we will get back to you again. And uh, uh, Wishing you for uh, having uh, a healthy uh, and uh, happy life uh, inside the home 
I know that this is quite a uh, problematic time, but we all uh, can able to overcome this situation. And that is the hope. And uh, yeah. So you want to say something? No, thank you for organizing this. And I think uh, we all like to have more human interaction. Uh, at the moment, we cannot have real human yeah. interaction. Some kind of interaction is still better than nothing. And, yeah. and so this than you, these days, this virtual interaction become more popular mm -hmm. uh, since like there is no other way to communicate with the whole world. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, you are also teaching with uh, like Zoom or virtual type of yeah, uh, similar platform. Um, we are going in a hybrid mode, but uh, for large classes, 